Awesome. Thank you. I'll just do a little mental shift, is that this talk isn't really about UX, it's not really about design, it's more about social change and the application of design and co-design tools within the contexts of uh, challenging social issues, so how some of those tools are being appropriated and used. Um, some of the issues that are um, most distressing when you look at the statistics around um, health and family violence, chronic conditions, childhood obesity, those kinds of things that statistically look scary um, but are much more challenging if you're living those experiences yourselves. And um, so I'm going to talk about how some of the tools of co-design and design are being stretched around some of those complex uh, social issues. Um, the title of my talk was The Evolution of Co-Design in Aotearoa. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about that. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that title. That would take about seven days to tell that story. So I'm just going to talk really about kind of where we are now and some of the edges of that practice and what some of the things that people are working in this space are sort of thinking about and dealing with and trying to work through. Um, so in that sense, this is a working through kind of talk. So if you hear my brain clunking, and you will because the microphone's really close to my brain, that's because we're literally kind of trying to work this stuff out. I haven't talked this stuff through in this particular way before, so I am apologize that you're my user testers and this is a prototype. Uh, but you guys should be fully comfortable with that. So I'm going to start by saying thank you um, to uh, the practitioners and the community members that are participating in this work. Um, there's people all around the country kind of working on different things. Um, it's hard work. It's rewarding work. It's the kind of work that can really be quite distressing and upsetting. Um, and I just want to say thanks to the community members and the practitioners who've shared their experiences so that I can share some of that uh, with you guys today. And I hope I do justice to um, their energy and their generosity. So just a quick definition of co-design. The term gets used a lot for a lot of different things. Um, when I'm talking about co-design in sort of my world, the definition of it, for me, it's a philosophy around participation. Um, it's a way for people to influence their own lives. Um, and if you want something a bit more concrete than that, there's a couple of graphics that I've been using for sort of 10 years or so to describe co-design. Um, only two, and they're very simple, partly because I'm lazy and partly because I can't draw very well. Um, and the first one just riffs off the UK double diamond version of the design process. Um, in New Zealand, we quite often use, there's four diamonds, so the two diamonds get split into two, that's a common way to represent design, but it's all the same thing, you know, it's the going out, it's talking to people, it's understanding stuff, it's synthesizing that, ideating, prototyping, same process. This is just a simple shape. Um, but I talk about co-designers opening up that process and democratizing that process and enabling community um, members and citizens to participate actively as creators, as decision makers, as ideators, um, as, um, as co in co-production. Um, so that's a simple way of thinking about that. And the other way that I talk about it is in terms of making sure that we, we think about co-design as citizens come, community members, so we're not talking so much about users necessarily because that's not their first definition. We're people first and then maybe we're users of services. So kind of just starting from whole people. Um, and they've got stuff going on. When we're, There might be institutions that initiate a project, but in co-design, the framing of that project is a shared framing. It needs to come from both perspectives and there needs to be shared value. So I just there's, there's totally flaws in the simplicity of these things but I'm just using those circles to indicate that overlap and that need for mutuality. And there's real friction in that. That's a very simple diagram, but there's a lot of stuff in there about power and how that works and how do you actually do the co of stuff and, and how you manage those things. Those things are even more complex within the context of complex social challenges. Um, and so while the Venn diagram just gets more interesting and tricky, oh, wrong, wrong direction, in terms of what is active participation, what is partnership, what is shared value, and all that sort of stuff, the double diamonds get less and less about the things that we're actually dealing with. So that it becomes less and less helpful, in a way, for naming some of the complexities. Uh, and uh, you, you may agree or disagree with me at the end. So just to explore a little bit about what I mean by complex issues, um, and make sure we're kind of thinking in the same zone, so any, any complex health issue or economic issue is always going to have multiple contributing factors. So the, the, you start with the bicycle drawing yesterday and you quickly get to a whole lot of other different systems that influence whether or not people ride a bike. So there's always influencing factors. 
there's never a single solution. We're not going to find the solution to childhood obesity. Um, there's lots of different ways we can respond to those complexities, and it needs to be at different levels. It'll be at policy, it'll be inside people's homes, it'll be in environments and schools. We're dealing with prevention and not just symptoms. So people talk about the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Of course, we need ambulances, but we also don't want to fall off the cliff. So the stuff that happens way far away from the cliff, that means we never get there. And that might be, if we want to address things around family violence, that means we might be working on things like gender equality and systemic racism, because those are the things that might get us to the point where we end up with family violence. But sometimes it's hard to make the argument for why you're working on those things in order to um, have changes down the line. So complex issues, the term wicked problems is often used to describe this sort of complexity. The other really key thing is that you need to engage citizens and community members and you need to work across boundaries and silos and outside organisations in ways that we historically haven't been particularly awesome at. So all of that stuff, then, co-design in this complex sort of social setting means you've got many, many different kinds of government agencies because they're all concerned, they're all involved, they've all got the capacity to influence different community groups, they're all involved in setting those scenes, schools, NGOs, and then all the diverse communities that are involved in living out those experiences or influencing those experiences as well. Um, often these are communities that are under enormous amounts of pressure, they get terms like vulnerable, at risk, there's all that sort of language that comes. They're often groups of people that are really over-consulted. They've spoken to a lot of people before, but nothing's necessarily happened as a result. So there's a real kind of sensitivity and complexity of the stories and experiences that people are having. Okay. So there's, I'm just going to talk through four things that we're kind of seeing in terms of how people are responding to those kind of complexities. There's lots of stuff. I've just picked out kind of four angles that describe some of the edges of this work of stretching the design and co-design processes into these contexts. So the four things are new teams and kinds of structures, a place-based approach, cultural opportunities, embracing the opportunities of different cultural perspectives and worldviews, and a focus on systems change. So I'm just going to talk through a bit of each of those things. So new teams and structures. We've got certain things like labs coming up. People might be familiar with the idea of social labs, so things like um, the Auckland Co-Design Lab or the Tamaki Health and Wellbeing Lab, where kind of new bubbles are opened up for sort of well-being and health and co-design innovation to happen that allows different types of teams to come in and work differently. So it's an attempt to create new spaces for different ways of working outside sort of BAU business as usual. So those are sort of the kind of some of the kind of structures we're seeing. And then in terms of teams, Quite often we're seeing a lot of temporary cross-agency teams. So different members from different public service agencies, community groups coming together. They may have never met each other before, they may have no design experience necessarily, but they bring different kinds of expertise, working temporarily around a challenge. They're designing with different kinds of citizens and stakeholders and community members depending on what the context of that challenge is. So as I said, these groups bring their expertise in policy and procurement, service provision, management, whatever it is that they're doing in their world. And the citizens and stakeholders may be bringing service delivery experience or lived experience of the issue. Because, because often there isn't anyone in here that's necessarily run the design process before, design coaches are often brought in to support, so that's a role that I would play. That the um, event of design coaches is, as I understand it, kind of a New Zealand phenomenon, and there's a bit of a background that comes through other programs government has run through Better by Design that is eventuated in this idea of a design coach. It's not the only form that, that happens in, but it's, I haven't found any other countries that are mimicking this process. I'm not making any calls about whether we're doing things right or wrong here, I'm just laying out some of the ways that we're working. Um, so I'll give an example of what that looks like. So last year I worked on a, a youth employment challenge. It was called the Attitude Gap Challenge. I was trying to understand in South Auckland there's a lot of roles that would presumably be appropriate for young people, but the young people living in South Auckland are not in those roles. So what's going on there? Um, why, why are we having that clash between expectations of young people and expectations of employers? So it was about working with those groups and understanding what was going on and what could be different um, on both sides. And so the people involved in that was a team from MB, so our Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, Youth Connections, Work and Income, Careers NZ, MSD, and the Southern Initiative. So people were flowing up from Wellington, 
we all huddled in a room for four months together, going out and inviting people in, but that was a temporary team from different parts of government, from different parts of the public service being brought together to work on this challenge and designing with groups of young people, employed and unemployed, whānau, church leaders, schools, employers and training providers for four months, doing, understanding the situation, trying to map it out, prototyping different things to see what could be done. And of course, responses were all across the system. There's change that can be happening at every single layer. And that's why all those people are in there, because all those people have the potential to influence change within their own scope. So trying to understand what that looked like. So that was a four-month sprint structure. So the idea, that sort of agile language of sprints is well within the, this idea of um, co-design. Another variation on that is an example um, from the Southern Initiative Auckland Co-Design Lab and Healthy Families combination. This has been running in different variations for a little while. Right now, um, I'm going to just talk about kind of where it's at right now. It's uh, the, the early years challenge, and their challenge is how might we support parents in South Auckland to give tamariki the best start in life, so tamariki being children. Um, and so this is a similar group where you've got cross-agency team coming together. They have a, they've done quite a few processes, so they're actually quite skilled in co-design, that team, but they still have some external design coaches. But they also have community members part of that core team as well. So people from community have come in and started to participate as part of that core group. So you have the co-design mamas, um, that self-named, so they're parents from South Auckland who are participating and starting to lead the design processes in their own communities. So they go into the local libraries and do the prototyping with other parents and other community members. So the structures and who's doing the work and where the design is is quite distributed and it's happening in different ways. And they're doing things like three-day sprints. Then that's, the, that's how it makes it possible to get people who have totally other lives to come in and actually focus on this work and give their time and participate. So they're experimenting all the time with how to make that work. So that first one was different teams and structures. The second one is a place-based approach. They're, these are all interlinked, as you'll see. So what does that mean? It means working in a specific geographical area, so a particular community, a particular location. And it's working with the specific challenges and assets of that community. Um, and it's building on the existing relationships that are already there. So you're not kind of coming in from the top, you're looking at what's going on, what are the schools here, what are the parks like, what is the environment, who works here, who are the influences already, what's already happening, what are the dynamics um, that are going on in this space. Uh, a a place-based philosophy also has a strengths-based um, philosophy captured within it, sorry. So it means you're building on strengths and you're looking to build capability in the community. So it brings with it a particular way of looking at the potential. It also means you're, you're looking for not representative users, but you're dealing directly with the communities where change is going to happen. So we're not looking for people who look like students at high school. We're dealing with engaging with specific students at specific high schools. And those are the young people that are making the changes or doing the work or um, looking at what's going on. So it's a bit of a mental shift in that regard. So one of the examples is another project that I'm involved in, um, the co-design mamas one I'm not, um, working together to achieve whānau wellbeing in Waitamata. Um, if you're not from Aotearoa, New Zealand, hopefully you're sitting next to someone that can do some interpretation for you, otherwise we can clarify after. Um, so the genesis of this project is, what is the latent potential of a community system to prevent violence? So how can communities themselves use their own assets and strength and knowledge to prevent violence and create violence-free violence -free homes and communities, schools, etc.? So this project is run, there's uh, members of the um, MSD at Central Government from Wellington, members of Auckland Council, and then, more importantly, network coordinators who come from three specific locations in the Waitamata region, Waves in West Auckland, ANCAD on the North Shore, and Torito in Rodney. So those are three locations in Auckland that share a DHB. And so while we have sort of generic ideas and frameworks from a central government sort of policy level, how they're implemented and how we think about them and how they'll become real totally depends on what's happening in those three communities. And we look at grounding everything and all the work with the people and the assets of those communities. So we're interested in scale, of course. We want to have an impact across the whole of New Zealand around family violence. But the only way this work will happen is if it engages directly with the particular people, with the particular dynamics and the things that are going on in each community and communities are able to translate those for themselves. So the, we had um, 
different teams and structures in play space. The third thing is the cultural opportunity that we have of looking through things from different lenses um, and building a more inclusive approach. So one of the ways that we're seeing that really strongly, and again, I'm representing um, colleagues from um, Healthy Families in the Southern Initiative who are sharing their work, um, is a kaupapa Māori and a treaty-based approach. And most visibly, what that looks like, there's lots of different ways that that manifests. Most visibly, it's an emphasis on relationships and whakawhanongatanga. So people first, trust first, connecting first. So starting with people and then design processes and things are built on top of that, but that comes at the start. So the teams that are working, Māori teams that are working in Māori communities are, are using the uh, a kaupapa, within the kaupapa Māori approach. And that means that um, we see different ways of working and different emphasis, although if you think about it, people first, you know, it sounds like a pretty good place to start, right? But also seeing cultural practices that keep people safe. So tikanga, um, manakitanga, when we're looking after people, we're making sure that the practices are the way they need to be to keep people safe. So those teams are making sure that those things are happening in their communities in order for this work and the change in any kind of process to um, be happening. Um, there are also, with that, is a, huge, a real focus on reciprocity. Uh, and this is a quote from one of the team members. So from a Māori point of view, a treaty framework, who is a dominant party, who has power, and who's making decisions? So those questions all the time at the beginning, all the way through. So confronting and negotiating and thinking about that and trying to keep that mutuality um, through these processes of involvement. One of the ways that this is um, being sort of, I guess, shared or becoming more visible is through a f the Afano-centric approach that they're developing within the context of the Southern Initiative and the co-design mamas is, a, is, is, a, is where this work is happening. And the, the easiest way of talking about that is to say that designing the process around whānau, not fitting whānau into bits of the process. And so when you think about my diamonds at the beginning, and I was like, here's the design process, and then you, the people come into it as, you know, as we go through it, and you suddenly think, hey, maybe that's not actually going to work so well when we put the design process first, and then the people through it afterwards. So this is starting to really um, force a thinking about actually what are we prioritising and how are we talking about where our priorities are. So some of the key ways that this... There's lots of ways this happens that you can't see, but some of the visible ways that this is happening is design sessions around whānau needs. Tamariki first, the so children first. So the children come, they're looked after, they, they're close to their parents. Um, the timings of the sessions are around whānau and parent needs, not around stakeholder needs. So physical structures changing and resourcing changing. Trust and relationship building outside the project. So in order for people to be willing to come into the room and participate and give their time, give their energy, give their stories, um, there has to be the whanongatanga first, there has to be talking to people and there has to be making sure people are safe and they trust coming in to that room and that, that that's meaningful, that relationship. So us saying, you know, there's this workshop on, well, all the work is happening outside that workshop. Whānau decide how they participate, when and how, and they have decision-making power. Um, so the, there is a set of principles that these guys have developed. I'm just waiting for them to publish that so it can be shared. Um, but this, they align this with tēnā ranga tāratanga, so the um, principle of self-determination. So it's whānau that decide whether they want to participate, what that looks like, and they set up the rules um, and the kāora of what that's going to be. So who we talk to, we only want to talk to one person. This is, you know, our kids are with us. There's certain things that they will set the boundaries, which is pretty much the opposite of how most design processes are set up. So that negotiation all the time of who's making the decisions and who makes the calls. So what's happening in these kind of processes is that we're building the design capability of whānau as well to lead the design process. So those parents are coming in, participating, building that trust over time, teaching each other, so it's a mutual learning process, but then they're able to start running the sessions and, and doing that design work with other community members. So different kinds of teams, place-based, cultural opportunities. Um, and the fourth one is engagement with systems. So systems looks like, and we've had a few of these different things have been touched on up until now, so I'm sort of building on some stuff. But working at system scale, not just human scale. So we're not interested just in hu human-centered, we're system-centered as well. We need to understand the system as a whole and how all these different parts uh, influence each other, and in particular what some of the negative or unintended consequences of policies might actually be when you look at how they're played out in people's lives. And the intent is to disrupt parts of, if not the entire system, in terms of how it's structured, because the systems are what reinforce the status quo of the outcomes, or even start making outcomes worse. 
And this means moving beyond projects. Obviously, if you're doing something as big as systems change, a little project, a little project where you do stuff, and then you say, okay, bye, everybody, we're finished, now we're going to start the next thing, doesn't sound like systemic change. So there's ways of needing to understand how do we continue beyond those, what do the structures look like to support this. I'm not suggesting that we've got any answers. We just kind of, people are playing with what it looks like to merge things together. And there's a lot of existing wisdom already in practices that we're learning from. It's not that we're we've got all the answers or we're coming up with the answers. There's actually a lot of different places and different cultures and different um, uh, practices that we can actually learn these things from. So Healthy Families is an example of the systems change approach. It's also place-based, so there's 10 sites around New Zealand that's an MOH initiative, Ministry of Health initiative, around creating health outcomes through systems change. So it's not about individual behaviour interventions where I try and develop a thing that helps you stop smoking or I try and help develop a thing that helps people manage their, you manage your conditions. It's a population level shift to create conditions that build healthy outcomes. So their role isn't to do that work. There's no way, no matter how big the public health workforce was, that they could do that work. Their role is to try and catalyze and enable that work within the communities that they work in and at different levels. And so they adopt and co-design and design approaches to help them with that work. So this is an example of one of the things that they're doing. It's the Manurewa smoking system. Um, and this is the big picture of the smoking map on one side, the kind of systems level, what are all the interconnecting factors, but what's the human experience on the other side? And so this is a group of um, Māori wahine who uh, are smokers and they're participating in that project. They're sharing their experience as part of the system of smoking and what that looks like. And you can start connecting things between the influences and the system side and the experiences people have in their lives. So it's connecting those worlds together. So this project is about bringing together Māori wahine who smoke, policy makers, health providers, local marae, the people who are normally thinking about we've got to make a stop smoking program, not having those conversations, having conversations about what's going on, why is it going on like this and how might it be different and how might we work together to start on that journey of figuring that out. So they're understanding the smoking system through data and models but also through the lived experience. They're developing possible system interventions but again building new connections between policy makers and community members and ca capability in both of those different groups um, for different kinds of change and different ways of working. So those are the four things that I just wanted to touch on that are kind of the edges of some of the stuff. New kinds of teams and structures, a focus on place, cultural opportunity, and a focus on systems change. So I'm just going to talk now um, a little bit about what some of the implications are of those things and some of the questions. So there's a much greater focus on impact and outcomes. Um, communities in whānau have invested, um, people have come in and given their time and their energy and they've offered things and they've done work. So something has to come out of that. There has to be action and there has to be change. Fan I'm not, I'll be a little bit facetious. Fancy designs are not going to cut the mustard. Like good ideas are not going to cut the mustard. Um, and designs a little bit, um, we've been criticised for getting too caught up in that start of the process and all the fun stuff at the beginning and not paying enough attention to what comes out of the end. And this is in the insights bulge, which is a term that Chris Vanstone and Taxi in Australia termed. And this can really catch us out. You spend so much time kind of learning and getting your insights and stuff that you've run out of money and you're just exhausted by all this enormous amount of stuff and, and you can't kind of move past that. So we have to avoid getting stuck in the insights bulge um, and put more emph emphasis on implementation and action. Probably if we're getting stuck and nothing's happening, we haven't paid enough attention to how we have to anchor or the relationships we have to build, or the whanangatanga, or the trust that has to happen and take place in order for any of that change. So there's different kinds of outcomes we're looking for then. We're not just looking for products or services or things that can be named, um, but we're also looking for outcomes that happen along the way. We don't have to wait till the end, and if we wait till the end, that's usually when we've tripped up. So every single time we're engaging, every engagement is an intervention, every engagement is an opportunity for building trust, for anchoring, for thinking, for learning of new ways and building connection. So for example, inside the family violence project, every conversation we have with somebody about family violence is either an opportunity, um, and we do that through talking about the protective factors, there's certain things that help if they're all working and we're doing awesome, that's a whole lot of things that are painful for communities and for us won't happen. 
um, or we prevent that from happening. So we're talking about what are those great things that we can be doing as individuals and communities. Every time we have one of those conversations, even if it's to understand what's going on in the community, we're enabling the capacity and the opportunity for people to think about how they could do differently because we're having this exchange about how that might be done. Or we're building a relationship that down the track is going to help make connections. So very different to sign a confidentiality form, don't ever talk about the research participants again because it really, really matters who they are in the relationship that you're building. It doesn't mean that you're not respecting confidentiality or any of those things, but those things might be different depending on what you're trying to do. So these outcomes of building connections, when we have policy makers and community members talking to each other for the first time about the impacts mutually of what's going on, um, the system starts to connect to itself and learn about itself, and that builds capacity for change. So Ingrid Burkett talks about knitting the system, uh, and there's real advantages to knitting things up, crossing over those silos. Also building the capability of teams, citizens, and whānau at different levels. So those public service teams are learning new skills, the practitioners, everybody's learning new skills about how we do this and how we can make the most of this opportunity to try these different approaches. I'm not going to go through all of these post-its, but these are thoughts shared by the co-design mamas when Tammy, who works with them, I said, Tammy, I'm going to go and share some stuff. Do you want to tell me what's going on for you guys? They just finished prototyping in the library, and she said, do you guys want to talk about what the experience has been like for you? So you can see down the bottom, I have changed now. The kind of changes that are coming out for people, for some people, they've, one person's got... Um, is employed for the first time, they've built the confidence and the connections to be able to go out and do that. For other people it's things like I'm presenting, I'm in front of people, I've got the confidence to stand up and do things I wouldn't have before. Similarly, the, the practitioners are also building skills all the time. Importantly, even though we're seeing awesome outcomes, that's two-way. So this is from Angie at TSI, we will always learn more from Fano than they will learn from us. Um, so different kind of outcomes. The ethics and soft skills needed are far more complicated. At least it certainly feels like that. People are working in their own communities with people that they have relationships with. So how do we manage that? What does that mean in terms of boundaries? Um, the relationships that people have are personal. They've built over time. How do they protect those and keep those safe and respectful? When they're inviting people into something that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't actually know what the outcome is going to be. So how do we create those safe spaces? Um, and people bring their whole self to this work. So if you're inviting community members to come in and talk about their lives and share that with you, they, they bring their whole life. So how do we manage sometimes when you want to focus on actually doing work, but the tension between you've invited people in, and so we need to keep things moving. All of those are kind of new skills to learn. So people working close to home, new kinds of boundaries, complex stories, and people in whānau bring their whole self. So reciprocity is front and centre, how do we manage that exchange, how do we keep that mutuality. This is another um, way of thinking about it, the treaty framework which looks at partnerships through the reciprocal value of each party can bring to the table. So the treaty actually offers us a lot of interesting frameworks and basis for thinking about how we manage that reciprocity. It's relationships rather than recruitment. And I don't mean that you don't, it doesn't mean that you don't do recruitment or use some of that stuff, but we're thinking much more around relationships. So again, great quote from An um, Angie, don't try and get people to your project, go to the people and see what's important to them and form a project around it. And even if it's not that simple, there's some stuff in there that's helpful for thinking about how we frame it. So two questions to just end with. I always like to have three, but I couldn't come up with the third one. My brain was completely full by the time I sort of got to here. What supports are needed to ensure community partnership? How do we create the situations and resource the things that need to be resourced so that people can come in and visit us in their b busy lives with their families and their jobs and what's going on for them, how can we enable that to actually happen? People are coming after work or after having looked after kids all day and, and we're asking them to do all this stuff. Like, How do we actually resource that? And how do we enable them to continue participation? Because people are not interested in stopping at the end of the project. That's not what happens. You just invested your life in this. Um, how do we resource um, the koha? How do we resource the relationship building? in the environments we need. One of the things Healthy Families is looking at is, is engaging with businesses and saying, can you release your staff and your employees to come and participate in these programs? Because at the end of the day, a greater healthy environment gives you greater productivity. There's advantages to the business in being involved. And they can do that because they're taking a systems view. So they can look at the mutual exchange at a systems level and start to think about new ways of participation. 
Similarly, what kind of new tools and terms and skills might we need? What sort of soft skills are what we talked about yesterday, but also the terminology we use, the visualizations that we use, the ways that we invite people into the process of working on these things um, may be substandard. Some of, there's a lot of, sometimes people love the word prototyping. On the other hand, people say it's really alienating and I can't invite my community into that because that, that language isn't helpful. It doesn't leave a space for me to be. So there's different ways of looking at it. Um, this is one of the, the, a piece of work by Tammy Portini, who's at Healthy Families. Her focus is on tamariki and early childhood education centres, and so she's reimagined the design process from this point of view of using the turtle to explain the turtle coming out of its shell, and that's her metaphor for being able to take that into early childhood centres and talk about what this process is and invite people into it. So I'm just going to leave with two quotes. This work is challenging for, for everybody involved because we don't... Okay, I'll start out loud. We don't really know what we're doing. We're doing the best that we can on the things that we have, but there's a lot of stuff where we're like, we'll try this with, and we'll build the right trust to do it and we'll see what happens. Um, and so people, the practitioners are confronted. It's challenging. Did I do a good enough job? Was this okay? Will I do it right tomorrow? So why are people doing it? Um, it's exciting because it's challenging and it makes sense because you're hearing the voices of the community. They can contribute and build the communities they live in, and having their voices heard at governance and policy level, often for the very first time. Uh, and this is one message that uh, one of the co-design mamas left at, after one of her sessions, which was, thanks for asking, thanks for listening, thanks for caring. So I'm going to leave us there. Um, there's a lot of people doing amazing work. Some of those people are in this room. This is some of the places, there's lots more places, but when I share the slide deck, you can go and have a look at some more of the other things and the other work that's happening if you want to. Thank you.